Welcome to another episode of EvolutionAtCall.org podcast coming your way. This is going to be episode 611. And today we're talking about Ross Patrick, Ross Flanagan steroid cycle. So uh, we're going to go over his social media influence. He's got a lot of uh, social media influence building up. He's been coming on a lot over the past year. We're going to talk about his diet training. We're going to speculate on a steroid cycle based on what we know he likes and what he's talked about. So we're going to have a fun show here. Um, now, this is a guy, uh, Ross, who he won the California Pro in 2023. He took first place, and he shocked everybody. Like, no one even had him winning it. Um, you had Tonio Burton and Sergio Oliva Jr. Um, and, you know, there was another guy in there, too, who were really supposed to finish ahead of him. So he wasn't even supposed to be even fourth place. He was supposed to be like fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth place. I don't know. But like it was a shocking finish and nobody saw it coming. And this is what propelled him on the map. And this is what allowed him to qualify for the next competitions, obviously the Mr. Olympia and all that good stuff. So the 2023 Mr. Olympia, apparently, um, you know, Mobster and I, we we looked into this and we saw that he finished. Basically, he did not show up. So he technically finished in last place at the Mr. Olympia, which last place at Mr. Olympia still makes you one of the top bodybuilders of the world, obviously. Right. But um, researching this, apparently he did not feel well that morning. So he had to pull out of the competition due to, to due to dehydration. So um, I'm bringing Mobster on this one. Mobster, talk to you a little bit about this. Um, go ahead. Yeah, look, I, I, there's a couple of thoughts here. Number one is to be in true Mr. Olympia type condition, or indeed, arguably, Steve, any crazy kind of condition for an amateur competition, professional competition, whatever else, is not healthy. Okay, so that's number one. Okay, if you are literally feeling cold. If you're super ripped, you feel cold all the time. I don't care how warm it is. You're hungry. Uh, everything aches. You are, because we've talked about this on multiple shows, of course. Steve uses the phrase chemical warfare, so you, you're kind of feeling toxic and so on and so forth. That's number one, Steve. Number two is diuretics. Okay? So uh, not only or is another one that I hear people say, but I quite often think it's an excuse but what's been done with the drugs, you'll get someone say they've had food poisoning. And that seems to be a common excuse. It's entirely possible, of course, but it seems to be a bit of an excuse. So the same thing would apply to dehydration. Was he ill? Because obviously, as I just said, you're not really actually that well, although you might look amazing when you're super ripped, super dry, ready for the stage. And you can, of course, get food poisoning. But equally, I suspect there's an element of uh, you just wasn't in shape. You fucked up your diuretics. You did whatever. I mean, uh, there's even an argument to be made, Steve, for the head fuck. You, you've you literally turned up and everybody else is looking amazing and you look in the mirror and you don't see what anybody else sees and you feel absolutely head fucked. And you go, do you know what? Fuck it. I know I'm, I know I'm supposed to be here. I know I've signed up the paperwork, but shit, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pull out. I can't do it or whatever else. So there's a bunch of stuff here, and you could pick one from any of the above, Steve. But let's assume for argument's sake that he was dehydrated. That's kind of what you're supposed to be. You are supposed to be dehydrated. You are supposed to not feel well, as I say. So the idea that everybody else is going to be kind of in the same condition as you, Steve, it applies. I would, I would imagine that a great many of the guys are going to feel pretty goddamn dehydrated on the day. So, you know, maybe there's an outcome. Here's one more thing, and I'm going to associate this with a head fuck as well, Steve, all right? I have competed in the past, as you know, and I talk about this on various shows. And I've, I've, when I was, there's a degree of being full of myself as well, Steve. So when I know I'm going to place, when I know it's between me and someone else, there's an element in my mind which is completely egotistical, but it helps to be that way in order to dominate and win a competition where I'm of the opinion, why are these other motherfuckers here? That person over there is just here to get PBs. They have paid, they have travelled, they're staying in a hotel, they've got to pay for food, petrol money, God knows what else. They are just here for fourth place. They are just here for 10th place. They are not here to win. I'm here to win. And there's an argument to be made where I sometimes would uh, talk with people, especially in coaching prep and whatever else, 
when it was almost a fear of success, Steve. So, you know, they, they, they weren't there with the attitude of, I'm going to win Mr. Olympia. They are there, perhaps, for whatever competition I'm there for, just to see how well I can do and whatever else. And maybe Ross has that element to him. Yeah. I mean, he comes across. It, it can be, well. you know, a uh, trial and error as well. Because I used to run, you know, long distance races. And, you know, I wasn't, I didn't go into that long distance race to win. I wasn't going to win, but I did it to test. Oh, yeah. I'm going to say I the same to thing. Test, I didn't but win I wanted any to test my when body. I was the first time. Yeah. I wanted to test my body and see what I could improve on to improve my mm. time for the future. So a lot of times, especially him being more new to this competition yes. circuit, he wanted to kind of do trial and error. Maybe he did it a little too much. Maybe he dehydrated yeah. himself a you little even, too much. You could even be overwhelmed, Steve, by the occasion. If, just imagine that you are a boxer and you've fought many, many, many amateur fights and even sort of local area fights and perhaps even national fights. And I take you from that in a, in a situation that you're comfortable with and I put you onto the world stage and I say there are going to be 30 million people watching you and you're going to fight the best fight in the world, it can be overwhelming. So there might even be that, just the occasion. So there's, also, a, there's a bunch too, of um, Yeah, it could be financial reasons. We're going to get into this shortly. Um, but also, just make it to Mr. Olympia and just being able to put on your social media, competed Mr. Olympia 2023. Yes. That alone, we can monetize that. So him just qualifying for Mr. Olympia may have been Really, all he wanted, you know, because he yeah, has yeah. his businesses it's on the side. Possible. So, talk it about doesn't his... just apply to Ross. I don't want to pick on Ross specifically in this example because, like I said, other people are going to be in the same situation. There's 18, 19 guys up there that are not going to win. So, the argument can be made for anybody. We're just going to pay people. your bills. So, I mean, yeah, you got to pay your bills. About this might be, may be the way that not just Ross, but other people in a similar situation might go. So, yeah. Talk about his three businesses and get in more on the social media, what you found. Yeah, so here's the thing, guys. I mean, it's it's kind of important, right? There's an argument to be made again in terms of social media, right? And it's a little bit of a dream. And we've even discussed this on another podcast where younger guys these days somehow imagine that if they have good TikTok stuff and uh, good social media skills and whatever else, they can monetize it. And there, obviously there are people that do incredibly well with that. We've talked about one fella, Steve, that made that actually uh, sent a tax return for his online training business, and he was not a big coach, but he had a really successful uh, Instagram online coaching business, and his tax return was for seven hundred thousand dollars. Right, so here's the thing: the reality of the situation, and we've discussed this about what what it means to be a pro in another show, is in Ross's case, I'm going to say he's actually outstanding in in two ways. One is he does a lot of clickbait, uh, comedy, uh, skits type stuff on social media, which probably gets him more attention than just pure bodybuilding stuff, but we'll touch on that momentarily. And the other thing is he owns free, reasonably successful businesses. And why do I say reasonably successful? On one video, Steve, he talks about how he used to be in the kitchen, knocking up this various foods, et cetera, that he's involved in. And he actually employs people to do that now. And he says, it actually frees me up to concentrate more on the training. So, Steve, the idea that he's able to do these particular things, I'm, I'm going to, it's called Flavor Gain, Gains Bakery, and a Project Official Athlete. So, basically, he's kind of clever. He's not relying on the income that he might make from Instagram. He's not relying on the income that he might make from being a sponsored athlete or, or from social media directly just for adverts that are paid through social media. He's actually got two slash three successful businesses that are putting bread on the table, and then he's looking to see what he can do with social media, and then he's looking to do what he can do when he wins prizes in competitions and monetizing the, the fact that he's a bodybuilder. And that actually makes a lot of sense to me. I think in this day and age, Steve, as you understand, and I understand, is you should not, I would say, Steve, rely on a single source of income. If you put all your eggs in one basket and said, I'm a professional bodybuilder, some some contracts are three months, some contracts are six months, some contracts require you to compete a certain number of times. Some you, you don't have to do any of those things. If you've got a couple of other things going on that put enough money on the table for you to pay your bills and whatever, and that's even, I think, in something he's actually got perhaps something else as well, Steve. All of these kind of things help 
meaning you don't have to rely on your income from being a bodybuilder. And in fact, arguably, Steve, they, they take away the stress for those things. And of course, <clears throat> you're not going to be a professional bodybuilder forever and ever, amen. You need to have other stuff going on. What happens when your career is over? What happens if you get injured? You need to have other things going on. So second string, third string, fourth string income. Yeah. So let's finish this. Yeah, let's finish this topic. We don't want to spend too much time on it, but he's involved with Flavor Gang, Gaines Bakery, Project AD Official. He does online coaching. He has an Amazon store, and he does supplements and accessories, just like all bodybuilders do. So let's get into his diet a little bit, Mobster, and then you're going to talk about his training. So um, he has really good videos online and shows you how to meal prep. And meal prepping is very important. If you come on our forums and you see the logs, the most successful guys on our logs who've really transformed themselves from looking from average Joes to like, wow, they yeah. meal prep. And they put their foods, they have their foods, you know, in different containers. And they'll do six different containers, right? And those, each container is a meal. And they'll meal prep that. Or they'll do like 10 containers and they'll meal and that will go into their fridge for three days. They'll take it with them to work. They'll take it with them to the gym, whatever. And it's very important to do that. And what's, that's what he does. So one of the videos that I took a look at and I really like, and this is something that I've adopted as well, is using a rice cooker as a tool. A lot of guys on the forums now are using rice cookers, maybe because I, you know, I was the one that brought it up a few years ago. But now it seems like half the guys on the forum now are recommending rice cookers. But here's the thing about rice cookers, and this is something I learned, is you don't just make rice with it. And he shows you all the cool stuff you can do with it. He does eggs, spinach, beef, beef broth, chicken, whatever else you can think of. He puts it in, the, in that rice cooker, and you can steam it or just cook it. And it'll cook just like anything else. You put anything in there, it'll cook it. And it's very easy to do. It literally involves you putting it inside and hitting a couple buttons. And boom, you've got something cooking. And it'll take about, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes, depending on what you're cooking, to cook. If you're cooking rice, it's going to take a little over an hour, obviously. Rice takes a while to cook. But the point is you can cook so much stuff in this damn rice cooker. So what he does is he fills it up to the top, to the very, very top shuts it, and then puts it in his car and drives. So if he's going to work, he's going on a road trip, he's going to the gym, whatever, you can get there, literally plug it back in, turn it on, and you'll have a warm meal that will, for you and a, a friend of yours, you know, that that's healthy. So you can just imagine how good that sounds. And make, You can mix in eggs, spinach, beef, chicken, broth, whatever, mix it all in, rice, and then you can just take it to work with you and have, have a nice warm meal at work. And it doesn't involve any packing or anything. And at the end of the day, when you're done, you literally just clean the, the clean little container out of the rice cooker and boom, you can start it the next day. So literally that food can last you uh, taking it to work with you. So those of you who work on the road or those of you who work and you're complaining that, yeah, yeah. my work yes. brings me. I used to work in a place where you'd show up in an office and they'd have donuts, right? And then for lunch, they'd order in Chinese food or pizza yeah. or something, whatever, junk food, right? Or Indian food, just junky food. And all that could be healthy. Indian food could be healthy, but not from where they're ordering it from, okay? No, no, junk no. food. So that's that's the thing. And it's like, it's just sitting there and everyone would go in and they'd eat it all. And then, of course, it would screw up work because you wouldn't be able to think as well and you you feel like shit the rest of the day and people would go into the bathroom and stink up the bathroom because the food makes your tears your stomach up so he's showing you how to do it this is how it can be done one more recipe i'll get into protein pancakes and he does it from scratch he does eggs protein powder sugar-free syrup and nut butter that's his recipe and he shows you how to make it it's really easy to make all you need is a pan and you can make it and this is a far healthier option than going to a restaurant. So this is a good way to get carbs. Now, for my protein pancakes, I do it a little differently because I use coconut flour as my flour base. But he uses, looks like protein powder as his base from what the video I saw. So, but anyway, either way, it's going to be a hell of a lot healthier than going to Denny's or IHOP and eating a completely fake uh, pancake, which is made from some crap that they brought in in a big box, some from the <laughs> fine white flour they brought in, like box. 
So, and then as soon as, uh, as far as calories on a typical day, he's, he says he's average is about 4,000 calories along with 300 grams of protein, which is pretty standard. And, and of course he fluctuates that depending on his contest shape. So mobster, you touched on that and get into his training. Yeah. Listen, guys, uh, I, I, I could be a lot better with my food and, and, and a lot of you could be a hell of a lot better. Steve and I have touched upon on multiple shows where we talk about the, the American and to a lesser degree, although we're fast catching up, Steve, uh, the UK ordering food in and, you know, the American, especially with regards to giving you large portions, but how many times has Steve told you, you know, you, uh, 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 about the sauces and the sugars and the syrups. And I know, for example, the pancake mix, you just talked about Steve, you can buy that stuff in 44 pound sacks. That's how those restaurants are doing it. I mean, look, right. You really got no excuse. You can watch YouTube, you can, some of the stuff real simple. You can spice things up. It doesn't have to be boring. And trust me on this, and I've said this before, when we've done shows, when we've referenced food and stuff, it is a piece of piss, as we say in the United Kingdom, to cook two meals in the same time scale as you can cook one with meal prepped. You can spend half an hour. Don't tell me you can't find the time, but then spend three hours a day fucking around on social media, YouTube, watching videos and, and playing games on your phone. But tell me you haven't got the time. And like Steve says, and I'll, I'll just to finish off on that one, Steve, how many times have we seen, if you come onto the forums, you could check this out, as Steve said, the people that nail it, the people that put their food up, so they can't cheat. They are showing you the food they're eating. It's not just us going, that looks like a lovely meal. And I've done fl plenty of replies like that, seeing the great images of food, etc. But literally, because they are showing you the food that they're eating, that's the food that they're eating. That's the food that they're putting in. That's the food that's fueling the workout. And... It's almost like if they do that, it's like 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 you are at work and you're showing the boss the work you've done. You have no excuse because you have done what you needed to do. Then you've gone to the gym. Then you've killed it. And what the hell? The result is you got fucking a fantastic shape. And especially if we go oh, trim that down a little bit, swap this in, put some fiber into your diet, push those weights a little bit harder. Boom. Three months down the road, they are the ones that look amazing. And that's what you need to do if you're a professional bodybuilder. That's what you need to do if you're going to get into shape. Let's move on a little bit, Steve, into the training side of things, right? So I'll touch upon some of the, uh, I will call them silly videos, because he does these for fun. So they're not meant to be serious. And he goofs around in the gym, and there's a ton of these. I would argue, Steve, it's close to the majority. And it probably gets some great traction. But some of it rings true as well. So there's certain things that he's fucking around in the gym for, for fun, for giggles, for, for the looks, for the views. But there's also, as I say, an element of where, you know, actually, although he's taking a piss a little bit, there are people like that in the gym. Now, some of the stuff, which is more serious, and this is where the training thing comes in, and he's not the only person. We're going to record some more shows in this vein, uh, and some of these people are doing the same thing, and that is they are showing you how to train. So, for example, and this is just one exercise, Steve, one of his videos is quite near the top of his page on Instagram, is him doing tricep press downs, okay? And he says, look, number one, full range of motion. You haven't got giant arms. If Don't tell me that you should, I'm only working your head when your arms are 12 inches. Let's build the size you've got. So full range of motion. No jerking at the top, no yank, yanking it down at the bottom, whatever. So number two, slow the fuck down. This is what he's showing you. It's not a slow, ridiculous, it's not what we'll call a super slow protocol, but it's literally just removing the momentum from the, 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 the exercise. So in the case of press downs, again, he's not throwing that weight down. He's not trying to accelerate it. He's tick-tock. It's going backwards and forwards, a nice steady pace, but the momentum's been removed. And the thing that he specifically talks about, because it's nothing he's talking about there is rocket science, it's not specifically different than anybody else. But the thing that is, is holding it just for a second in the contracted position. So with the arms extended at the bottom of the movement and just ever so slightly squeezing his triceps. Now, I'm going to expand on this a little bit, Steve, because I want to focus on this one particular thing. And it's, it's something that Ross is making a point of. OK, so imagine that you did that on every exercise that you do all the fucking time. It is incredibly hard to do. Really, really hard to do, Steve. I, I would be hard pushed to train the way that he's talking about on a regular, repetitive, month-on-month -month basis. However, if I could do that, and I was a bodybuilder, how goddamn muscular would my physique be? Because I am 
not cheating. I'm squeezing the contraction. I'm emphasizing full range of motion. I'm trying to get the absolute most I can out of the exercise. And I'm not just doing this now and again, Steve. I'm doing it every fucking workout all the fucking time. That is unbelievably hard. But our local pro does this thing with leg extensions, and I've seen him coaching people, and he's adjusting the foot position. He's having you holding it at the top. He makes you lower it slowly. And the, the, it's just fucking brutal, especially if you're even close to the kind of numbers that you would normally do in terms of poundage on the stack, on the machine, on the bar, whatever the fuck you're lifting. To do that on a regular, frequent basis, month on month, year on year, absolutely guarantees that you're getting the most out of the movement. And I like the fact that that particular kind of emphasis was applied in terms of him explaining what he's doing. The same thing applies. I, I see people do uh, lateral raises, Steve, where right from the beginning, the heart's half a movement. I see people doing the same on leg press, where they're doing one leg leg press, but they're on their fucking mobile phone and they're talking to a person. Why are you doing that? It's stuff like where they do that weird skew if leg press thing where you're only doing one leg, but you're kind of almost laying on your side and you're working your glute, but you weigh 150 fucking pounds, right? So there's definitely an argument to be lifting heavy weight. There's definitely an argument to doing the basics, but there has to be, as he says, in this particular example, a way of doing these exercises to get the absolute most you possibly can out of them. And it ain't easy. It's almost understandable why people do the things that I've just talked about in in that screw with kind of wonky kind of way. Because in a way, Steve, those are easier. But you will not build the muscle, muscle, especially at the beginning, the muscular foundation that you would, and get to the point where, like Ross, you are on stage. That is super, super hard. Let's move on into the steroid part of the uh, podcast, Steve, and I'll, I'll let you jump in for a second before I come in. Yeah, and, you know, we he's done some videos on... Um on you know on steroid use and yeah um so here here's the thing um what we think you know he uses steroid cycle when he competed and what he uses now and all this other yeah. stuff you yeah. know we can all we can all debate that so i've um mobster mentioned he's seen pics of him where he says he was only on 900 milligrams of tests per week i saw a video on his instagram where yeah. he's flexing and he claims he's only on 300 milligrams a week and he's arguing <laughs> with people in the comment section. Look, I get it. Okay. Look, here, here's what happens is people will say they're on a lot less gear because they want people to hire them as a coach. They want people to hire them to train. So of course they want to make it look like, like, look what I achieved on only this much steroids. You can do the yes. same thing Buy my package. You know, that's kind of the thing that they want to do. Because they don't want to come out and say, yeah, I'm using 5,000 grams of steroids, but yeah, you're going to – 5,000 Yeah, I mean, the, the, the argument here is – let me jump in for a second here, Steve. There's an argument to be made that you don't want people thinking that what you do in the gym means nothing and it's just the steroids. So I get it, right? You don't want to emphasize that I'm taking all this gear. This is the reason the size I'm. You want to emphasize training hard, great nutrition. Equally, is 300 milligrams of testosterone going to make him as big as he is and get one of the Is it fuck? Absolutely not. So we know. We also know because he's told us that he doesn't like orals. And he, this is the things he says he doesn't like, right? And I think the reason he doesn't like them is because he's used them, he's experienced them, and he felt like shit on them. And there may be things he submitted, swap, swapped in, should I say. But here's what he said. He don't like orals. Doesn't like trend. Doesn't like Decker forward slash MPP, Primo or EQ. But I'm going to say that he did use them because he knows now that he doesn't like them. And he may well do stuff that he sometimes doesn't like in order to get where he is and do the things that he does. He also talks about something which is kind of interesting, Steve. He says, I only like to use PDs I can get on with, and specifically for the mental health reasons. In other words, sometimes the way that you feel on these things is so goddamn awful. Trends a great example again, Steve, that it's hard to do the other stuff that you're doing because you feel so shitty all the time. However, let's speculate on what we think would be more realistically a prep for him, even if he's doing things that sometimes he doesn't like to do, and he might not want to emphasize how you know the the, the importance perhaps of PEDs over training and nutrition. I'll I'll, I'll do some stuff here, Steve. I mean, me and you can debate it. So we don't see any issue with tests. So we're talking about we think fifteen hundred milligrams testosterone per week, especially around competition. One thousand two hundred and fifty milligrams a week of masterone. We know 
that's a hardener. And when you're in shape, as he will be for the Olympic stage and other big competitions, it's almost a must. 500 milligrams of trend, even though he says he doesn't like it, that's probably not too crazy a dose for someone that doesn't like it versus other guys that we know do over a gram. 100 milligrams of Zanav Anavar, and again, even my, my, my competing gym owner just recently competed this weekend, Steve, was doing that much Anavar uh, for competition. And then we are, we are going to talk about 10 IUs of HGH two times per day and then 8 to 10 uh, intravenous units of insulin per day, Steve. So, I mean, look, is this anything different from what we think other pros are doing? Yes, but only because... We, we, we think he probably, if, if, even though he hates it, there might be a necessary evil in regards to the trend, but he's kind of doing less, in our opinion, of a trend than perhaps other pros might do, even if they don't like it as well, just simply because it's so goddamn awful to be dealing with and I want to be able to train, compete, and do the stuff I need to do without feeling fucking so shitty. Uh, the 1,250 milligrams of Masteron might be arguably a little bit higher than what we would normally do, see, perhaps typically around a gram for the pros, and especially in the last few weeks pre-competition. The 100 milligrams of Anavar isn't. I actually see that quite a bit uh, in the uh, people that are coming close to a competition. You know that what most of you listeners would be getting on with 50 milligrams, but 100 milligrams seems to be difficult for a short period of time, two to four weeks pre-competition again. And then I don't think we're looking at, we could argue actually, Steve, with regards to the HGH and the insulin use, because we know that a lot of uh, pros would use a lot more than that. And the other thing I will say, Steve, is one of the videos I watched was the pre-show research was shot four years ago at um, Flex Lewis's gym, the Dragon's Lair, uh, for Jay Cutler's channel. And then the difference between his physique there and more recently on Instagram, I'm going to say looks about £20. It might be the pre-competition shape of the Dragon's Lair versus a softer look, but he certainly looks bigger now. So perhaps what we're looking at there is uh, what we would say is is off stage versus on stage physique and the amount of HGH and insulin that he would use. What do you think on that cycle, Steve? In terms of what he's done, yeah, and what he's and, doing now. And I do a late edition diuretics as well because we, you know, we can obviously surmise that these guys are manipulating their their water ahead of these competitions, and um, that's one of the things that. You really need to do trial and error when it comes to this sort of thing. Because you want to, as you said at the beginning of the show, you want to achieve that certain look for the judges, right? You have to time it. It's a timing thing. Everybody's a little different. So you have to have a really good coach, maybe even two coaches, that can be in your ear and giving you advice. Now, in this situation, it's a balance. And if you overdo it on the balance, you can end up missing out on Mr. Olympia. And that's a real shame, especially if he had, re you know, he worked really hard yes, to prep for Mr. Olympia and to be able to have to pull out due to dehydration is a really bad break. So when it comes to diuretics, this is something that pros are messing with. But really, if you're an average Joe, insulin, high doses of HGH, diuretics, and many of these anabolic steroids that we talk about are simply not going to be part of your arsenal. But when it comes to Mr. Olympia stage, it's chemical warfare. They're going to do what they have to do to look a certain way. So I'd add that as well, Mobster. And look, the trend balloon, yes, I get it. He doesn't like it, but it's a necessary evil when yeah. it comes to bodybuilding. Because if you're going to be able to look a certain way at that level and compete against the guy next to you, you're going to have to use trend. Because trend does something better than any better than any of, of these other steroids, and that's nutrient partition. So it's going to allow you to get stronger rapidly, yes. and it's going to allow you to put on globs of muscle, especially when you're stacking in the insulin HGH on top of it. So it's a necessary evil. And look, I get he doesn't like it. Who likes trend? Like who out there actually likes trend? It's one of those steroids you get on. And you might like it for like two or three weeks. And by week four, you're like, man, I hate this shit, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I go through that when I used to use trend because I used trend back in my mid thirties. And, um, you know, I went through that every time I used it. And it's like one of those ones that you love at first and you start hating. So monster, we have a minute left. Finish with your final thoughts and take us to the disclaimer. 
yeah, I'm thinking, Steve, like you said, you need to learn what works for you. You need, you need to understand how your body is in specific things. For example, arriving early at the venue, especially if you're traveling halfway across the States or out of country, Steve. We've seen that make a difference for top level athletes. You need to know what, how you respond to certain chemicals. Uh, and, and there's even an argument to be made, and this is for an amateur listener type person that's thinking, you know, I'm thinking about get, doing a competition. What I'd almost get you to run, or Steve, if you did a consult, get you to run uh, what felt like a competition stack and train like it's for a competition before you step on stage so that you get to a, an idea of how it feels, what it looks like, what works for you, things that you need to change, etc. You don't want to be making those mistakes or having to fix things in the last few weeks of, of what could can be the biggest occasion for you ever in your life. Why, why, be, why do that? And again, it's the Olympia stage. You want to be your best, same as the Olympics, same as any huge event. So, you know, while you don't need to try everything there is and you can work with some amazing coaches, having the knowledge and experience is going to help you. So perhaps in a year or two, Steve, we might see him back on stage with that experience, with that knowledge and no dehydration and looking absolutely fucking amazing and mind-blowing. And if he does, he does have some amazing quads, Steve. And so I'd like to see that happen. So fingers crossed for Ross and uh, hope that you like the, the show. Post comments below. Come on to the forums. Let us know what you think. Do you think Ross has got a chance in the Mr. Olympia in the next few years? Let's, let's hear what your thoughts are. Please note, we are not doctors and opinions are ours. It's our view based on our experience and views on the topic. A podcast for informational purposes and entertainment only. The freedom of speech and the First Amendment apply.